I'm so glad to be with you tonight to have a chance to talk about my small big idea. It's going to help us solve kind of a tragedy in our state's sad food story. That's the standard American diet, and it sucks. We all know it's full of processed foods, lots of salt and fat and sugar, and it creates this dysfunctional food system that's fast, cheap, and deadly. But it doesn't have to stay that way. And as I start to explain this to you, I want you to see where I live in the food desert. Now, this is west central Minnesota. And, you know, it, it doesn't, if you live there, you know that it doesn't look like a desert. We actually have some, ironically, some of the most fertile soil in the world. But the USDA says that if you have to drive more than 15 miles to get to a reasonably sized grocery store and produce, you're in a food desert. But we're not alone. This is the whole state. And this is sad. And it happens in the Twin Cities, too. But here, you only have to be a mile away from a decent grocery store. And it just it doesn't have to be this way. I'm going to give you a little bit about my backstory that's going to help us with this, because the other food desert <laughs> that we have in Minnesota is winter. You know, there's not a lot of growing going on there, usually. Although we have good season extension, and that's coming all the time, we got a ways to go with that. So imagine, back in the early 2000s, I was um, sharing a, a summer CSA with my future husband, and we were getting, like, for the first time, an amazing array of vegetables, learning how to cook them, really enjoying them, really kind of digging this whole thing. And then fall comes, the first frost, and the CSA is over. And I would get kind of grumpy about that, because, you know, I'd go into our local grocery store and see food that I didn't know where it was grown, what was sprayed on it, or even when it was harvested. So I was kind of complaining a little bit, and Chuck ended up calling fall the wine season with an H. <laughs> and, and he was right. You know, and one time when I was kind of griping about it, he said something that ended up changing our lives, because he said, you know, when you hear yourself saying, somebody really ought to do something about that, it usually means that somebody is you. And I couldn't get that out of my head. You know, I was a master gardener, and I was thinking, you know, there's got to be a way that we can grow in the winter. What can we do? I was looking at Canada. They have a big system that's, you know, government-subsidized, and, and that wasn't the solution I was really looking for. So we had to innovate. And fortunately, Chuck never threw away a book in his life. So he got out his books from the 70s on passive solar design because we knew this thing needed to be fuel-efficient and something that could be replicable so that we wouldn't just be solving our problem, it could be something that could move beyond our need for winter salad. <laughs> so um, after a little while, this is what we came up with. Now, first of all, in passive solar design, you need thermal mass. That's a way that you can collect and store that heat that you gain during the day when the sun is out, and it can release when the sun's gone. We decided to put ours under the greenhouse so that it wouldn't be taking up precious space in there for the growing. So we went down four feet below the, the frost line, put in a, a foundation that also has stiff blue foam on the inside, so it creates a heat tank instead of a heat sink where it could get lost into the, the cold so soil beyond it. Now, in that, we have a big-sized rock, and there's perforated drainage tile. That's pipe with holes. And it, it runs all through that rock, and it's connected to pipe that go up the sides to stovepipe that goes across the peak where the heat rises. When it gets to a certain temperature on there, fans kick in to move that hot air down into that rock. And then as it moves through there, there's two separate... You can see them at the, the far end here, the south end here. They're just in the rock. So it can percolate out through there and create that sort of rotating system of, of moving it. Now, the greenhouse itself, of course, has to face south. And it, has, it needs to have an angle that's pretty much in line with where the sun is in the wintertime. So it's coming straight in, and we're getting as much heat as we can when the sun is out there. 
and it's covered with uh, twin wall polycarbonate, and it's built onto the back of the existing two-stall garage. So we have the ability to go into the greenhouse without ever actually having cold air come in from there, kind of have a buffer that way. And it gives us a place where we can harvest and, and pack everything. And there's still the one-stall garage, so then everything can go into that car and out to be delivered and never actually meet the ferocious outdoors. There's also a little backup heater in there in case it ever gets below 35 degrees. And it's really, when you look at it, it's a pretty simple system. But the question was, would it work? Well, you tell me. That's pretty, I love that picture. <laughs> Because it demonstrates just how effective this very simple, simple system can be. And I have a lot of friends who are you know, market farmers, and they tell me that with theirs, they have to spend hundreds of dollars in the spring working in their hoop houses on the you know, propane that they need to keep it warm enough. And this one uses about $100 to $200 a season, not a month, from September to May. So after 12 years of growing in there in a myriad of different winter systems, which I think we can kind of be guaranteed is going to keep happening, I think we nailed it. Now, as we did this, we wanted to make sure that this was indeed something that other people could do. And we found out pretty quickly that it was. This is a guy who built one twice the size of ours, about 15 miles away, and it's just as effective. And we started getting people interested in what we were doing. We had a lot of tours coming in, and uh, we had different people trying it out. So you could see that they take that simple idea and they apply it for what they want to do. And it was, getting, uh, it was getting a lot of attention. We were doing workshops and presentations. We even wrote a book to help other people do it because we were getting a lot of emails and phone calls and we needed a break. And, and it was happening. We were getting people together to start talking about this. There was this synergy going on. And then we found out that Chuck was granted a Bush Foundation fel leadership fellowship so that he could continue that work we thought was important to start getting the people wanting to do this together in an association so that we could work cooperatively and do things together. But unfortunately, that was the time when a tragedy befell our small, big idea. Because a month after we found out that Chuck got the fellowship, we found out that he had stage four cancer. And a month later, he was gone. And that knocked the legs right out of me. I, I couldn't see a way forward. But the amazing thing about a good, innovative idea that can really solve important problems is that other people recognize that. They value it, and they want to see it happen. So we had supporters who were working with the Bush Foundation to convert that fellowship into a grant to the University of Minnesota Extension's Regional Sustainable Development Partnership to do the work that Chuck wanted to do. And in their infinite wisdom, they hired me to help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, smart people. So it gave me a way forward and it gave me a chance to turn a tragedy into something else. And despite the darkness that happened, what happened next, as far as I'm concerned, has been transformational. Since we started out working with the RSDP, we've been able to do things and and access resources that I could never have done on my own. And it started off with us seeing that there was a need to do some different kinds of research on improving that greenhouse design and also improving the production. And I was able to work with people who are really smart and they know what they're doing. And that's really useful to be able to bring out to other people. So the research that we've done is available online on the Extension website for the RSDP so that anybody can access that for free. And we created this Facebook page, and I was like, oh, Facebook page, you really think so? And it went crazy, you know, so it's not just us. It's also people from other states and even in Canada that are accessing that information and sharing with each other 
you know, what they want to do and, and pictures of their greenhouses and, and it's all starting to come into play. It's, it's so exciting. You know, because the thing to me is we need to be able to get these greenhouses into these food deserts where they're really needed. And I know that there's some things that are going on in the cities right now where they're using big indoor facilities with um, hydroponics and LED lights and, and it's huge and it's kind of complex and mechanized, but you know, I'm, I'm not interested in dissing any of that because we're in a stage of innovation and we need to be trying everything we can to see what's going to work and what we can learn from each other. And you know, there's a lot of people to feed in the city. But the thing that I like about this small design is it can go where it's needed. And in the food deserts, there's so many opportunities for that. You know, we can have them built alongside a community garden or as part of a retirement facility. But my favorite one is the schools, you know, because if you've ever worked, you know, with a school that has a, a summer uh, garden that they're doing, it's kind of hard to get the kids and their parents to show up in August to do the weeding. But if you have one of these greenhouses that we already know is fuel efficient, built right onto the school, voila, it's in full production when all the kids are there and who doesn't want to work in a greenhouse that's 80 degrees and humid when it's 20 below outside. And they can also take, they can do curriculum in there and they can take the food that's grown in there to the school lunch program. And you're going to see a TED talk by a, by a terrific guy, and Rod Finley, and he said something that really stuck in my head when I first heard him talk. He said, you know, when kids grow kale, kids eat kale. <laughs> and what I'm suggesting with this idea is that when you've got kids growing kale at school, and there's some school event where you're actually bringing out some of that food for people to eat, kids eat kale with their parents and their families and their community. That piece of it is really life-changing to me. But all of this is very exciting to me, but it's also personal. Because when I turned 50, I was told that I had diabetes. And I recommend that you never schedule your annual physical on the week of your birthday. <laughs> Just a suggestion. I had been playing the pre-diabetes denial game for years. And finally, when I became a widow, the addictive nature of the comfort foods of our sad diet were comforting my sad heart until I realized that I was feeling numbness in my feet and blurring in my vision, and I realized that you don't get a pass on developing a healthy life for yourself when it's compromising your nervous system. My doctor had me on four medications, was talking about insulin, and basically painted this picture of slow decline with no way out. And I couldn't accept that. I had too much to do, and it was too important to do it. So I got back to doing research. I found this book called uh, End Diabetes, and the doctor who created it said that you can use food as medicine to heal the sugar imbalance in your body. And as I was reading it, <laughs> I started laughing out loud, because it's like, what he wants you to do mostly is eat grains. <laughs> so the solution is like a stone's throw out in my backyard. I started eating like that, and when it, in a month, my blood sugar dropped so low I was off all but one of the medications. In two, in two months, I was in the normal range. And the neurologist told me that I was going to start getting the feeling back in my feet, and the, the blurring was gone. And the 40 pounds I lost hadn't hurt either. But the thing of it is that I know is that I'm not the only diabetic in my county, and I'm not the only diabetic in this state. And it becomes imperative to me that we have more of these greenhouses in the places where people need them the most. It's life-changing. And it's saving my life. So I see these greenhouses as an opportunity to change the way we look at our winter food system in Minnesota. These suckers are so good, they're addictive. <laughs> and I want everybody to have access to them. Because in the end, it's what we do together to change this food system that's really going to matter. So I want to leave you with probably one of my favorite quotes. It's by Margaret Mead, and it's so true. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens 
can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you. Thank you.